Well, welcome to 10 Minute Record Reviews, episode 300, here at 10 Minute Record Reviews non air conditioned headquarters. And I'll just pause for a brief celebration of this milestone. This is the second in a series of jazz label guides. And without going over too much of the introductory ground from the first episode in that series about CTI, I'll just reiterate why it is that I think labels matter. First, and probably most importantly, they can affect the creative vision and the artistic freedom of the artist in question, sometimes for good, often for ill. Secondly, they may provide resources, people, time, musicians, equipment, marketing, promotion, etc., to make that artistic vision a reality, or they may not. And third, they may be able to provide ongoing support to an artist, perhaps financial, perhaps emotional, which allows for sustained high-quality output over time, or they may not. I began the series with a discussion of the label CTI and its subsidiary imprint Kudu, and these labels, of course, were the creation of one of the great figures of 20th century music, the producer and record executive Preet Taylor. But as I'm focusing on record labels rather than record executives or producers, left out of that story is a label which, inarguably, I think, was Taylor's greatest single legacy, even if he was only at the helm for a few months, and that, of course, is Impulse Records. Here's a picture of my highly incomplete and highly imperfect Impulse collection, and this video is based largely, as you might expect, on my impressions of listening to these Impulse releases. But there are several other sources I should mention. First of all, in my video on CTI, I made reference to Mark Meyer's excellent 18-part interview of Creed Taylor, which is still up on his blog, Jazz Wax. Second, in recent months, I've been dipping into this volume by Ashley Kahn, which is basically the definitive account of Impulse Records from inception, well, not inception of the record, but from the beginning of the label in the early 1960s until about 2008. I think it's out of print. Uh, you probably have to get it from a reseller, but it's a must-have. I've also been spending a ton of time digging through the Downbeat archives, and I'll put a link to that along with a link to the Jazz Wax blog down below. And finally, I continue to have a huge debt to the producer Ed Michel, who was one of the key people in the history of Impulse Records, who spent some time with me, as many of you know, doing a couple of interviews in this channel a couple of months ago. And as mentioned, there are links to all those materials in the description below. Finally, just before I get going, I'd like to give a shout out to two other YouTubers, Nathaniel Ahart and Johnny Radio, links to their channels are below, who were kind enough to invite me to participate recently in a video counting down the top pop records of the 1970s, if you'd like to hear what I think about Pink Floyd, and really, who wouldn't, then I absolutely suggest that you check out that video. I had a great time doing it. I was honored to be asked. Once again, that's Nathaniel Ahart and Johnny Radio. More power to those guys. If one makes a list of the most important and influential labels in post-war jazz, there are a whole bunch of names that come up. Savoy, RCA Victor, Blue Note, Columbia, Prestige, Riverside, Atlantic, Verve, and Impulse clearly belongs on that list. But while all of those labels had various periods of ascendancy, arguably none enjoyed a longer period of both critical acclaim and influence on the world of jazz than Impulse did in the mid-1960s. In fact, such is the strength of Impulse's catalog and the mystique around the label that if you said to jazz fans you could only keep one label from your whole collection, I know it's a horrible thought, but we're just pretending, my bet is that Impulse would be the number one label that people would seek to protect. Impulse, of course, is a label inseparably associated with a saxophonist, John Coltrane, and as Khan and others have said, you really don't get Impulse without Coltrane's commitment to the label, not least as far as we came to understand it. But it's so much more than that. It was a cutting-edge label that set trends and featured the avant-garde, but also did a sizable trade in lots of other kinds of music, soul jazz, big band recordings, spiritual jazz, lots of other styles, and all the while channeling the experience of black America in the 60s in musical terms better than anywhere else. From its very beginnings at the end of 1960, the label exists pretty much as a creative beacon in jazz all the way through with some hiccups until 1977, at which point the crescendo of corporate buyouts and accounting mentality, which had been sapping the energy of the label for the past six or seven years, finally does for it. These days, they're owned by Universal, bundled into a mashup of old jazz labels called the Verve Music Group. And so whatever suits have owned Impulse, really since 1977, have basically been in the business of reissuing their back catalog, because for jazz, probably more so than for any other kind of music, except maybe classic rock, I guess, the business of the back catalog is often as good or better, in fact, I think in Impulse's case, it was always better than whatever contemporary sales were. 
So I'm not going to talk much about what happened since 1977, but I should say that there are, here and there, a few releases, some good quality releases actually, which have happened since then, but they tend to be one-offs which are self-produced and where there's a mutual benefit to both the artist and the label to having that association. Some of the more recent music really is worthy of that association. I'm thinking of the records by Sons of Kemet, for instance. But for all intents and purposes, the story of Impulse really comes to an end around 1977. And it begins around Christmas 1959. Impulse, like CTI, is a story which begins with Creed Taylor. And I covered Creed Taylor's background and early professional life in that video, so I won't cover that old ground here. But I will pick up the thread around 1956. At that point, Taylor was fresh out of the military in his first production gig at Bethlehem Records, a tiny little jazz independent, and he makes a jump to ABC Paramount because they had a bigger budget and there was much more upside. ABC was in the business of trying to become a major record label. Up until that point, they were a fairly minor player. Taylor sells them in his capacities, they buy it, and on board he comes. His breakthrough at ABC was kind of a weird record called Sing a Song of Basie, which, however, showed his bosses, his new bosses at ABC, that he was more than just an A&R guy who could find the production booth. He really knew what he was doing. The whole concept was a record full of Basie numbers where Lambert, Hendrix, and Ross, three contemporary singers, would sing the melody parts, and session singers would sing all the parts that normally would be played by instruments in Basie's orchestra. The problem was the session singers they brought in sucked. So Taylor and the group conceive of a different plan where, in fact, they are going to sing all the backup parts. This is made possible because multi-track recording is now available. And on top of this, stereo, which ABC was one of the first labels to actually use, is now in play. So this record comes out with the same three people singing all these different parts in glorious, fantastic, highly technical stereo, blows people away, wins a couple of Grammys, and Taylor has instantly proved his worth. This got Taylor ahead of steam, and he spends the next few years making about 100 records, mostly jazz, some pop, also some novelty, and some drinking songs records. But his first love was jazz, and he found himself constantly trying to shoehorn jazz records in and amongst the pop, which was basically the ABC Paramount mainstay. The label, of course, was closely associated to the TV network, and it was, in some ways, just a vehicle for some of the artists who appeared on American Bandstand. By Christmas 1959, Taylor's urge to do something different, still within the bounds of ABC Records, was overwhelming. And he comes up with the idea, well, originally for Pulse Records, although he found that Pulse was actually the name of an electronics firm, so couldn't use that, for a record uh, sub-label within ABC, which was jazz only, which would have top quality artists, which would have top quality production, which would be packaged and marketed in such a way as to be completely memorable and obvious to the buying public. Having settled on the name Impulse, he then works with a graphic designer, Fran Scott, the wife of the clarinetist Tony Scott, to design the distinctive orange and black color scheme and the unforgettable logo. In the spring of 1960, with the concept basically in hand, Taylor then goes to his boss at ABC, a guy called Harry Levine, and pitches him on the concept. It wasn't just the artistic vision for the music, it wasn't just the colors, it was also the packaging. These incredible gatefold sleeves, actually is a strange example because the Love Supreme actually is, is uh, you know, weirdly had a, uh, a white spine, but uh, these gatefold uh, sleeves with very little information on the outside, these beautiful shiny covers, all the information in this case, or I did, oh, hang on, we all, we all know what that looks like, I think, anyway, all the information on the inside. So if you look at a Columbia or a Riverside or a Prestige or a Blue Note record from 1960, what you get is a single sleeve, you get a thinner cardboard, and on the back, we've probably a picture of the artist or something like that on the front, but nothing particularly arty. And then on the back, what you get is about a 750 word essay written by Nat Hentoff or Ira Gittler, or sometimes the producer of the record or what have you, basically giving you the rundown on little histories of the artists and little sort of snippets about the music and so on. No mystery. You could see the whole picture right then and there. Impulse Records, you really have just the names of the artists. You you have you know these incredible slogans and uh, and uh, and unforgettable graphics in the records as well. The spines were going to be wide and colorful. They were going to be very visible on the shelf. The cardboard was going to be very thick. It was a classy product all the way through, and it was going to be very expensive. In fact, it was going to cost twice what ABC's normal packaging cost. And so, Impulse Records, if Levine went for it, were going to have to be retailed for two dollars more than the normal four dollars it was being charged.
luckily for Taylor, luckily for all the artists that appeared on Impulse, and luckily for us, who get to listen to these records, Harry Levine was a show business guy, not really one with an accounting mentality. He loved the concept, he could see what Taylor was trying to do, and he gave him the green light. Taylor then spends the rest of 1960 trying to figure out how to deliver on this, and in the very late fall, he goes into the studio with the first clutch of Impulse artists to make the very first set of releases. The music of Impulse is not the easiest thing to summarize. Label's output is quite varied, sometimes even experimental, certainly at times avant-garde. It moved with the times all the way through those tumultuous years from 1961 through 1977, and allowing for the fact that jazz labels normally had a degree of variety in the kinds of artists and music they released, in those 16 years, arguably, I would say, Impulse had the greatest variety. For instance, in 1964, if you're shopping for jazz records and you were looking at Blue Notes, you knew that it would be high quality musicians playing high quality music, recorded in a high quality setting, but the chances were pretty darn good it was going to be a small group playing hard bop. With Impulse, you also knew the artists would be good, you also knew that the music would be good, you also knew that the production values were going to be good, but you didn't know exactly where it would be under the broad umbrella of jazz. It could be a small group, it could be a big band, it could be avant-garde, it could be bluesy, it could be instrumental, it could be vocal. In terms of the whole catalog, according to my math, if you exclude best ofs and other sorts of retrospectives, there are about 300 unique releases in the Impulse catalog between 1961 and 1977. And of that total, up to about half are what I would call the cutting edge of jazz, the most contemporary and sometimes the most challenging jazz of the day. Everything from modal jazz, to free jazz and the avant-garde, to spiritual jazz, to jazz heavily informed by black political consciousness. And within this ridiculous category that I've just created, Cutting Edge Jazz, you really cannot look past Taylor's main marquee signing when he was still at the label, John Coltrane. These are just a few, some of the superb records that Coltrane puts out at the time. Um, the fantastic ballads record with uh, his uh, classic quartet um, an attempt to demonstrate that they could actually uh, play jazz, which apparently was necessary at the time. Um, this, uh, another early release, this excellent record, the eponymous Coltrane. Oh, and this is upside down. Um, a later release, uh, a more challenging variety, uh, Kula Se Mama. Anyway, Coltrane had been at Atlantic, and there he had put out some excellent records, including not least this one, Giant Steps, which set the jazz world on its ear. And Atlantic were paying Coltrane pretty good money. They were paying him about 70 grand in today's money a year. And that might not seem like a lot, but in 1960 jazz terms, when very few artists got paid much money at all, it was pretty good. But in the spring of 1960, Coltrane had left Miles for the second time. He was forming up what would be his classic quartet, He'd made this string of excellent records for Atlantic, and he was in a position to ask for more. He was also aware that a label mate of his at Atlantic, a guy by the name of Ray Charles, had recently jumped over to ABC and had been given a really sweet contract, which included a substantial chunk of his record sales. Taylor was determined to get Coltrane, but it was mutual because Coltrane was also keen to see what he could get from Impulse. And in the end, the deal that Coltrane gets with Impulse is a substantial jump from what he was making at Atlantic. Again, today's money there, he's making about 70K. Impulse, in his first year, he makes 100K. Subsequent years, he's making 200K. But whatever they were paying Coltrane, he repaid enormously, not just for the quality of the music and the record sales, but also functioning as the label's highest profile A&R man. He was busy bringing in some talent, which we now recognize as really singular jazz talents that may well have been overlooked at the time. Coltrane also, through his own musical progression, gave credibility to the so-called new thing, free jazz, avant-garde, call it what you will, through his own experimentation. But all that said, and excluding his posthumous and archival releases, in the six and a half years that Coltrane was with the label until his death in the summer of 1967, he releases 16 records. And the story of cutting-edge jazz and the label goes well beyond him. Of course, it does include his own entourage and his protégés, above all, his wife Alice, who goes on to establish a distinct and magnificent jazz identity of her own after his death, but also some other truly remarkable jazz people. Pharaoh Sanders, who got added to the Coltrane quintet as it was in the last uh, embers of Coltrane's career, and Archie Shep, 
another person, I mean, very clearly a protege because the cover of his first record is couldn't be more protege-ish uh, if they tried. There were also really amazing contributions made by Coltrane's former bandmates. This record, by the way, is just incredible, if you don't know it. This is Elvin Jones and Richard Davis, just the two of them, uh, making some really spectacular music. And uh, McCoy Tyner, of course, had a fairly extended run of records on uh, it's a Japanese pressing, as you can tell, uh, on Impulse as well, and really cemented his own style, his 60s style anyway. It also includes the great Charles Mingus, a notorious label hopper and burner of bridges who, notwithstanding, made three of arguably his very best records when he was with the label. This is a fantastic one, just him and a piano. It also includes Yusuf Latif, whose mid-60s work and his group at that time, uh, arguably his best ever work. And the same, I think, could also be said of the next artist. I'm just going to run by you here, uh, Chico Hamilton, who had come out of the West Coast scene, but really achieves something quite remarkable in his run of records with Impulse in the mid-60s. It also includes the pianist Ahmad Jamal. Here's a uh, not impulse uh, release of an Impulse record. It's actually on B with records, because if you want the Impulse release of this, uh, or at least a, a properly vintage one, you're going to have to part with about 500 bucks, um, who in the late 60s and early 70s, produced by Ed Michel, produces some of the, well, I think, the best work in his whole career. And this so-called cutting-edge category of jazz, and it also includes the last great wave of impulse signings years after Coltrane had departed the scene, people like Dewey Redman, people like Michael White. This is a fantastic record that I've only just recently gotten to know, highly recommend. Again, hard to get hold of, and people like the incomparable Keith Jarrett, who can stake a claim to being one of the most, if not the most important jazz musicians of the 1970s, and of whose impulse releases I sadly have none. And so overall, this was the roster, this cutting edge roster, Coltrane, yes, but not only Coltrane, which convinced the record buying public that when they bought an impulse record, they were with it. Now, the second category of impulse releases that I'm going to talk about is what I'm going to call old gold, and these are either reboots or another platform for classic jazz performers, many of whom made their bones in the big band age. There are about 50 of these records in the Impulse catalog, and they include some of the very biggest names in the history of jazz, obviously Duke Ellington here playing with another giant of an earlier age, Coleman Hawkins. And I have a few others of these as well. So. Count Basie and the Kansas City 7. This is another fantastic record, one of the earlier releases, and I'd overlooked it for a long time, but it is really, really good. Uh, here's one by Johnny Hodges. Everybody knows Johnny Hodges. Well, maybe younger people didn't, but they did after this record came out. And here, of course, is another old war horse, the vibraphonist Lionel Hampton with You Better Know It. Lots of exclamation marks, lots of exclamation marks in general on Impulse record covers. One more I'd mention is this one uh, by Benny Carter, again with another bunch of, uh, of real veterans here and some more contemporary players as well. Um, this is another good one and there's a follow-up which isn't quite as good. There's some others I don't have by Milt Jackson, by Ben Webster, by Dizzy Gillespie, by P.B. Russell. So what you have, in addition to all that cutting edge stuff, is a who's who of swing era jazz making their way, often for just one record, sometimes for more, onto Impulse. It was a clever move by the label because these people were often out of contract at the time. Ellington was out of contract when he made the record that he did with Coltrane. And there was a certain fascination with these artists appearing on this much more contemporary label, kind of like if Elvis showed up on factory records. And just as the presence of Coltrane and the avant-garde crowd reassured contemporary, younger, hip jazz fans that the label was on the cutting edge, these artists gave real blue chip credibility if you were recording Ellington on the regular, this had to be a serious jazz label. One of the most interesting features of this particular set of records are some of the pairings that happen, either sort of never before, never again pairings, or pairings of artists from different eras. So for example, here's a record made, a very famous record, and this is a really shitty release of it, uh, made by Coltrane with uh, the singer Johnny Hartman, which is now acknowledged as one of the finest releases on the label itself. I think I also mentioned before Coltrane's recording with Duke. Uh, this is a Japanese press and as you can see Impulse had licensed their work to uh, King Records of Japan. 
that sounds pretty darn good. Then we have Roy Haynes' record, a one-off with uh, Roland Kirk, appearing here in the forest with a number of other excellent players, including uh, Tommy Flanagan. And this effort with uh, the trumpeter Clark Terry and the band leader Chico O'Farrell um, in full Mexican garb, largely, as you might expect, a bunch of Latin tunes. One more of these odd couple pairings is Tijuana Jazz. I just love how the condition of this one, which is, I think, an original and is in very minty condition, uh, with uh, the trumpeter Clark Terry and Gary McFarland, the arranger who appears on a number of different Impulse records in different guises over the years. So all in all, including the cutting edge stuff and the old gold releases, that accounts for about 200 of the roughly 300 original releases on Impulse. So what's in the other 100? I'm going to call this category the Impulse Grab Bag. It's an intriguing mix, a ton of variety, some kind of weird records too, which probably explains why I have fewer of these than of the first two categories. First of all, there is some straight ahead, what you might call hard bop or cool jazz, and or, either or, in those lanes. Um, for instance, here's one by the West Coast stalwart drummer Shelly Mann, uh, 234, and there are also records by Curtis Fuller, and Freddie Hubbard, and a guy called Terry Gibbs, who played the vibes in that category. There are some records by people primarily known as arrangers. I'd mentioned Gary McFarland. You can also throw Gil Evans into that mix. There are a substantial number of what you might call soul jazz records, including this very important, very early, and only appearance on Impulse by Ray Charles. This is, in fact, the second uh, release on the label, Genius Plus Soul Equals Jazz, which is a fantastic record and sold absolute crate loads, which totally takes the pressure off Taylor in the early days. And then in terms of soul jazz too, you can't forget all the records, although I don't have any of them, by the soul jazz organist Shirley Scott, either with or without her sax playing husband Stanley Turrentine in tow. There are a whole bunch of excellent blues records, including one single but excellent record by John Lee Hooker, and a whole bunch of good records by a guy called Mel Brown, of which, sadly, again, I have none. Strangely, ABC also had a blues imprint called Blues Way, and those blues records, for reasons neither I nor, when I asked him, Ed Michelle understood, didn't end up on Blues Way, they ended up on Impulse. This third grab bag category also includes a bunch of records that are, if not pop jazz, at least pop aspirational jazz records, jazz records that were intended to hopefully make a bit of a dent on the pop charts, probably no more significantly than the run of records by Gabor Zabo. This is his Jazz Raga, and it's my favorite record cover, I think, of the 1960s, because particularly of this picture with the Vespa, the sitar, and the beautiful woman with the bucket hat. Anyway, uh, that's pretty old world. But I think you can also put people like um, the arranger and band leader and general kind of pop jazz wizard uh, Quincy Jones and his uh, record, The Quintessence, in that category as well. There are some records by singers, some of whom didn't have much profile before Impulse or after Impulse, but the records themselves are pretty interesting. People like Lorez Alexandria, I already mentioned Johnny Hartman, Frida Payne, and perhaps my favorite of all, although I don't own it, the record Gordon Jenkins presents my wife, the blues singer, Beverly Jenkins. And finally, in this grab bag category, there are records that really don't even have a category of their own at all. There is a record with two recent Russian defectors called the Russian Jazz Quartet. The purpose of that record, I think, was to capitalize on the defections. There is a tribute album to the assassinated president, John F. Kennedy. There is a tie-in record, a uh, commercial tie-in record by Chico O'Farrell tying into a, a brand of cologne. So if you're just getting started collecting Impulse records and you want to make sense of all this, how do you make sense of all this? One way, I think, is to understand what was going on at the label during two very distinct eras, which are defined pretty much by the ten years of the two most prolific producers at Impulse. First of all, Bob Thiel, and secondly, Ed Michelle. Now, you'll note that I didn't give Creed Taylor his own era, although I really kind of described it because it was really the build-up to Impulse that was Creed Taylor's greatest contribution. But he does, as I mentioned, stick around for six records. Those six records and Taylor's vision of Impulse as a label which would be visually and sonically distinct from the rest of the jazz landscape remained the blueprint all the way through the 1960s and well into the next decade. Taylor, as you may recall from the discussion of CTI records, was always 
regularly involved in making sure that the sound of his records was absolutely right. And he would religiously, for instance, use Rudy Van Gelder's studio. He certainly used it for all of his impulse releases, and he sticks with Rudy all the way through his CTI years as well. But Taylor also wanted to make hits, and he was not averse to the music he made lurching over into the pop lane. He wanted jazz to sell, and he tried to craft records which would be commercial without, as he saw it, the endless solos of what you found on Blue Note or Prestige or Riverside Records. He also liked to experiment. He also was willing to go to bat for a concept for an album, to go to bat for the idea of a big band, if that was what he felt the music required. And these attributes and his pop sensibility means that Taylor's career, amongst other things, is associated with a whole bunch of really successful crossover efforts. And even though he only makes six records, the diversity of those records marks Impulse out as different from the start. One of the very first releases, which I showed earlier, was a spectacularly successful crossover effort of a sort, Genius Plus Soul Equals Jazz by Ray Charles. Two more of those records are by trombonists, uh, the great Kai and JJ, and then this one by Kai Winding and his group kind of experimental of four trombonists, a lot better than it sounds. Two more of the Taylor records are kind of experimental records by artists who are arrangers first and foremost, and arrangers across a wide variety of musical styles over their careers. That includes this really uh, shoddy <laughs> reissue of a fantastic record by Gil Evans out of the pool, um, and this excellent record by Oliver Nelson, The Blues and the Abstract Truth, which has Oliver Nelson, who's a guy who ends up basically doing TV soundtracks um, in the latter part of his career um, with people like Eric Dolphy playing very Eric Dolphy like alto sax in this record. Anyway, the combination doesn't necessarily make sounds on paper, it's fantastic in practice. The last record that Taylor makes before he leaves Impulse is the only one that he makes with his marquee signing for the label John Coltrane, and that of course is Africa Brass. Again, another really quite experimental release. And then just like that, he was gone. He'd made this big splash, he'd made ABC's Gamble on Impulse look really, really good. Verve had just been bought by MGM. Norman Grants was no longer in the picture. They had a roster of incredible artists, better than Impulse had, including one of Taylor's great musical heroes, Stan Getz, with whom he'd always wanted to work. So he hops over the street, and now Impulse is desperately looking for somebody else to fill his shoes. So exit Taylor and enter Bob Thiel. Still in his 30s, but a veteran of the music industry, a private school kid, started his own labels and his own jazz publications, and was always selling, always hustling. Like Taylor, he was a jazz lover. He knew the record business and he wanted jazz to sell. Unlike Taylor, he wasn't a producer who was going to try and impose his vision on the music. And this was partly a matter of necessity because he'd been producing pop records for the previous six or seven years and was really behind in terms of jazz and was scrambling to catch up. And so he had no choice but to let people like John Coltrane do what they wanted to do, at least initially. And that works, and it becomes his M.O. basically over the rest of his time at the label. He gets out of the way. He lets the artists fulfill their own vision on record, even if that means he has to run interference with the label to allow them to record some highly lengthy and non-commercial pieces of music. In his autobiography, which is another source I should have mentioned and I'll link to below, he realizes, certainly in retrospect, that he knew he was part of something that was a lot bigger than him, a social movement that was bigger than him. And one thing that he does is try and record and archive everything he possibly can. He, after he leaves the label, he takes steps to make sure a lot of the tapes are preserved, which is one reason why uh, we have so much high-quality archival material uh, being released to this day. It's largely because of Bob Thiel's determination to keep this music alive. Thiel's era lasts from the spring of 1961 to the spring of 1969, and it has two contradictory themes. The dominant one is of letting the artists lead. He signed great musicians, he respected the great musicians who were already with the label, and he was open to further suggestions, particularly from Coltrane himself. He also let artists lead in the studio, and he ran interference for their non-commercial work with the label. Some of the best examples of records that Thiel helped see the light of day include Coltrane's Live at the Village Vanguard, which has some fairly challenging material on it. Thiel didn't really even understand it at the time, but he knew there was something there. Coltrane's really remarkable record, uh, Ascension, uh, which is probably the single least commercial thing that Impulse put out in its entire history. And uh, this record, which didn't really make much dent in the charts, <laughs> is just bristling with attitude. Uh, Three for Shep by the uh, saxophonist Marion Brown. Uh, these guys 
do not have a commercial bone in their body, at least not in this photograph. At the same time, he was aware of the bottom line. He always had the suits on his back because of that. And this partly explains some of the big names who did one-offs for the label, which partly offsets the avant-garde stuff. Thiel was also not immune to a corny or even schlocky project if he thought it would sell, or occasionally if he thought he could scoop a composer's credit or a performer's credit. Uh, Ashley Kahn in his book is polite about this. I don't think I need to be as polite. I think he basically, occasionally he was a bit of a scammer. Um, here's kind of a good example of this. One of the very last releases that came out when Thiel was with the label, Bob Thiel and the new Happy Times Orchestra with Gabor Zabo, but really pretty schlocky. One more thing to note about Thiel is his commitment to maintaining Taylor's vision for the product, the overall look and feel, the laminated covers and so on, and also the continued use all the way through his tenure of Rudy Van Gilder. Eventually, perhaps inevitably, a label with expensive production costs that relied on sales which were being eaten into by rock and roll and soul music, Thiel ends up falling out with the increasingly ham-handed suits that are taking over at Impulse. He goes off to create Flying Dutchman records, which you should absolutely check out, particularly records uh, like this one, Astral Traveling by Lonnie Liston Smith, or anything by the vocalist uh, Leon Thomas, who, who is the yodeler on The Creator Has a Master Plan. And Ed Michelle is hired to do A&R and production duties at Impulse. He's really a different generation from Thiel. He's younger, came of age in the 1960s effectively, but he has some important similarities to Thiel. He had a solid background in jazz, first of all, having apprenticed under Dick Bach at Pacific Jazz and under Oren Keepnews at Riverside. Like Thiel, but unlike Taylor, he saw his primary role as a producer as being somebody who would allow the artist's vision to come alive, and part of his role too was to run interference with the label to allow that to happen. In fact, of those three great influences on Impulse, Taylor, Thiel, and Michelle, Michelle is probably the least commercially minded of the three. And he oversees some remarkable records. To my mind, a peak equivalent to the great peak of 1962-1964, where the records that he was producing had the artist's vision blowing past what anybody would reasonably think of as commercial music, records which are now considered to be part of the spiritual jazz canon. In particular, it's hard to think of any other label giving as much license to folks like Alice Coltrane. Here's this wonderfully brilliant and slightly wacky organ-centric record, Universal Consciousness, or uh, Pharaoh Sanders. And this, again, tremendous outing. Thembi, almost all of the records that he does in this period of impulse are worth gathering. But there are also some important differences between the Thiel era and the Michelle era. First of all, Ed was not a big fan of Rudy Van Gelder's work, and that long association between Van Gelder and Impulse comes to an end. He tended to use a variety of studios, first of all in New York, and then in LA, where the label moved in the summer of 1969. And while this isn't Ed Michelle's fault, the distinctiveness of Impulse releases starts to diminish to control costs. The lamination stops. The cardboard starts to become of a lower quality. The vinyl suffers what all records suffered in the 1970s, just getting thinner and nastier. And maybe worst of all, the orange and black spines disappear. The irony of all this is that all the while that these corporately imposed changes are happening, the suits are harassing Michelle about why his records aren't selling as well as Creed Taylor's records were selling at CTI, such as this one by Joe Farrell, when what Taylor was doing here with the glossy laminated gatefolds, uh, with the enigmatic covers and the information inside and so on, was exactly the formula that he started the impulse that impulse has stopped doing. Michelle perseveres at Impulse until the corporate musical chairs begins to intensify in the mid-1970s and they finally chase him out along with some of those great musicians in 1975. But not before he ends up recording the last great wave of talent at Impulse. And here he's helped by an A&R guy called Steve Backer who handled a lot of the artist recruitment. This is a new crop of artists who take Impulse right back to the top of critical and artistic credibility. It's people like Keith Jarrett. It's people like Dewey Redman. John Clemmer, Sam Rivers, Michael White, and the Argentinian saxophonist Gato Barbieri, who's, uh, I only have three of the four uh, uh, sort of cycle of records he did for, um, this is what, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, for Impulse in the early 70s, fantastic records. And with this comes a degree of success. And for a while, there's money there to fund the kinds of production which made Impulse famous. But while the artistry was there, 
the corporate vision was soon gone. Backer leaves first, then Michelle is fired in 1975, and then for the final two years of Impulse as anything resembling a proper label, a guy called Esmond Edwards, a great record person in his own right, takes over as the head A&R and producer. And the verdict on this period is hit and miss, more miss than hit. And this is nothing against Edwards, as I say, who knew what he was doing, but he did not have the backing. Probably the very best thing which came from this period was this record by John Handy. But bear in mind, this is an impulse record. It's a, it's a single sleeve. It's got thin little cardboard. It's got, you know, this looks like a bad version of, of uh, a Blue Note uh, back cover. Not even any photographs in the back and really very hard to believe this is actually an Impulse record. And so in 1977, the curtain basically comes down for Impulse. Its catalog is then bought and rebought. Its holdings are poorly maintained for years. A fire may or may not have destroyed a lot of the original masters uh, a number of years ago. And it exists now largely as a reissue label. So for instance, here's my copy of Inception, which is a, a fair reissue of the original. Um, there are some exceptions, though, like, uh, as I mentioned, some of the stuff that's done by the Sons of Kemet, which I think really does stay true to the original history and vision of the label. But basically, once you get past 1975, you kind of have to do your homework. To close out this video, I'll make a few brief suggestions, things you might want to know if you're actually out there flipping through the bins or online looking for vintage impulse releases. First of all, the series numbers are in their own way sequential. So there's obviously one through 100. After they hit 100, a nine is added in front to make it a four digit number for reasons which kind of escape me. But the sequence is pretty easy to follow. So you have, for instance, release 99, release 100, then release 9101, and so on. They always begin with an A rather than an I for impulse, which I think was Taylor's way of ensuring that they would always be listed first in any trade publication which listed catalog numbers. In the catalog number for impulse releases, A means mono and AS means stereo. And up until release number 139, uh, this one I've shown you before, a three for Shep with uh, Marion and Archie looking kind of fierce, you can get the releases in either mono or stereo. After that, it's pure stereo or sometimes quad. This is important for more reasons than just whether or not you prefer mono or stereo, because on some stereo releases, particularly earlier in the 1960s, what you get is a hard panning of certain instruments, sometimes to the left-hand channel, sometimes to the right. And this is particularly noticeable on some John Coltrane records, where for some reason, his saxophone, his tenor, is panned all the way over to the left-hand speaker. And this, I find to be kind of a distracting thing. It's very noticeable, for instance, on my stereo copy of A Love Supreme. This disappears for the most part as stereo ceases to be a gimmick and a novelty and becomes the normal way one listens to music. This is a first world problem, of course, but it is distracting, and particularly with Coltrane because his tenor is a very dominant sound, and what you end up with is a very imbalanced soundstage. The next little tip I would say, and in all these kind of audiophile comments, I should say, there are people who care way more about this kind of stuff than me and seek them out and defer to them. And if these people are watching, do please comment. But I personally don't find it that important to obsess about it being a U.S. release per se. Impulse from very early on had licensee relationships with some very high quality producers in other countries. HMV in Britain, they had their own unique imprint in Canada called Spartan. King Records, as I mentioned, in Japan, Clave in Spain, and all of these had LP masters, which were identical to the ones used to press records in the US. I've got a number of Impulse Spartans and I'm really happy with them. They're actually quite easy to tell because they have this nice little, you can see that gold name Spartan stamped on, in this case, on my happy horns of Clark Terry. His horns got the stamp. What matters more, I find, is the year of release rather than the country of origin. Personally, if an Impulse record was made before 1975 or up until, I would not think about buying a release subsequent to 1975, unless we're talking about some of the more recent uh, high fidelity analog reissues about which I think you should still exercise a bit of judgment, but are certainly worth looking into. This matters most when I'm considering buying an early 1970s reissue of older material in Impulse, and I'm trying to do things like avoid that floppy Dynaflex vinyl. My final two points are closely related. First of all, if you see a shiny impulse gatefold, buy it. 
If you don't own many Impulse records, almost anything from the 1960s is worth picking up. And related to that is another point, take a gamble. The quality of almost anything to do with an Impulse record is equal to or higher than pretty much any of its competitors for a period of about 12 years. The music is very likely to be classic, and even if it isn't, it's probably going to be at least, at a minimum, wonderfully weird. So that's Impulse Records, or at least my take on the label. Love to hear your take. If I've missed anything you think is important or you have any other thoughts, please do leave a comment below. And above all, thanks for sticking with me through 300 episodes.